I found that that pastoring is 70% fathering. It's it's important to me to talk to you because most of the people that, that our audience sees now are people who are new sons. You remember me with the jerry curl, yeah. <laughs> you know. Being able to watch you shoulder that before there was any notoriety. And I feel privileged to be able to watch you while it was in the infantile stages to really get a feel for what real ministry looks like. This wasn't me, but I watched someone else come late <laughs> and try to come up to the, uh, the podium area after service had started. Now you talking about being able to fry an egg on your head, it was literally like smoke. <laughs> Ministry isn't about pulpits or microphones. It's giving service. Challenge yourself not to lose the human touch. If you don't serve well, you don't lead well because you lose empathy with the people under you. We, I know we're getting to the point that we don't think we need a church or a pastor, but you do. You need somebody uh, that will be in your life what life didn't give you. Well, hello everybody. I'm excited to have this opportunity to uh, share two of my sons with you, uh, Bishop Wayne Crozier from Charleston, West Virginia, and Pastor Derek Faison, who is now in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're just gonna let you eavesdrop on a conversation that we're having. Uh, they know my background, they know my roots. They were, both of them knew me almost from the inception of my pastoral ministry anyway. Uh, I've been preaching longer than I've been pastoring, but they go way back to jerry curls and uh, and a towel around my neck and a much, much, much smaller version of uh, T.D. Jakes than what you would know. Uh, but I want you to welcome them. I want to welcome you myself. We're glad to have you here today. Thank you, Bishop. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks for having me on this call with you guys. Uh, to me, uh, you are proof of my ministry, uh, living epistles read of men every day, and uh, my ability to uh, lead or steer you through the storms in your lives uh, and, and be mixed uh, grace and truth to the right degree. The Bible said we beheld the wonder of his glory, talking about Jesus, full of grace and truth. Some people are all grace and, and no truth. Wow. Some people are all truth and no grace. But you have to balance justice and mercy. You have to sit on the scales right beside each other. So you can't be so graceful that you don't chase it. But you can't be so judgmental uh, that you don't forgive. And, and as you disciple your sons, people are gonna be people. Yes, sir. You know, people are gonna be people. They're gonna, they're gonna do things. They're gonna do it right. They're gonna do it wrong. They're gonna get it right. They're gonna get it wrong. They're gonna fail. They're gonna have mishaps. They're gonna go through crisis. They're gonna go through divorces. They're gonna go through setbacks and, and backslide and everything else. And still, you must stand on the wall and preach and, and not be any better than the father of the prodigal son who was, who was running out there to meet his son fresh out the hog pen. And he's the only one running in the whole story. And, and, and everybody else is doing something else. And the only one running is the old man. Yeah. And he's running toward a smelly son. Yes, sir with love yes, sir. and and restores him a ring and a robe and kills the fatted calf and uh, and and brings him back into the house and then when the elder brother is outside the father goes out and addresses him away with this notion that everybody has to come to you mm. sometimes you have to go to them yes, sir. and go get them yes, sir. i am here today because somebody wouldn't got me I had backslid and, and left the church and was doing my thing. 
and uh, working for East Steps. And, and Mother McCaskill showed up on my job with a big prayer cap on her head. Tell her, what is this I hear you that backslid? The devil is a lie. And she was about to start speaking in tongues. I heard up, got to the door. <laughs> <laughs> Smelling like a pack of cigarettes. But I heard up, got to the door. I said, I didn't know you was in town. I want to see you at this revival, you know. Yeah. And it was that 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 she still wanted me. Yeah. To come. See, you comfort people with the comfort where which you have been comforted. You love people with the love where you're with you've been loved. You give grace to people because you receive grace. You give mercy because you're going to need mercy. And if you if you just let the oil slide, you know, and don't 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 dilute it and pollute it, you'll, you'll always be effective. I, I thought we would start talking about uh, Nashville is a totally different culture mm. from, uh, uh, from Charleston, uh, which I'm familiar with uh, both cities to a degree, mm. but Charleston is home for me and totally different from Dallas. Mm. So uh, we've, uh, yet we've all had to deal with the same perplexities. We've got different cultural connotations, different regions of the country, but we're still dealing with the COVID-19 virus mm -hmm. and the unexpected shock, at least it was for me, mm -hmm. that 2020 would, would shut us all down uh, to varying degrees, make ministry have to be much more innovative, much more creative than it's ever been before. And I, I want to know, uh, I know you both had to be innovative but what have you learned when you think about from March until now? What have you learned? How have you, how have you been informed as pastors uh, through this pandemic? What skills has it brought out in you? What needs has it underscored for you? Uh, how, have, how have you steered through the vicissitudes and, and how different is it for you now than before? Press your face and I'll let you go first. Well, well, I'll be quite honest with you. Um, in, in terms of uh, social media and technology, a lot of the things that I was doing before uh, was approached more like a toy mm -hmm. rather than a tool, right? Yeah. So it was communication, it was pictures, posts, catching up with friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But with COVID, uh, it made us look at it as a tool Mm -hmm. that could be used for ministry and a platform and also uh, staying connected. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the switch for me was trying to look at it more as a way of, um, I won't, well, I'll say discipling, connecting, uh, reaching that went beyond just um, the friendly aspect of it. It was the mm -hmm. only way we had to communicate and to stay in touch and getting our ch church um, involved in the understanding that this is a tool that we can use and not just an inconvenience that we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that helped us was that um, all the sectors were having to do it. So we weren't like an oddity, you know, everywhere you looked, you know, every business, every sector, every part of society was doing the same thing. So that helped to take some of the, uh, the scariness out of it because we were all trying to figure it out at the same time. Have you learned anything about yourself that you didn't know before? Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> I realize I don't like being isolated. <laughs> oh, <my dad. laughs> you take for granted that you can just go visit somebody, go have a hamburger, you know, go meet up or something like that. And it was a weird feeling. Um, not only not having a place to go, not having a place to go. You, you couldn't get out or move around or go to some other environment, a movie theater, a mall, a restaurant, change the environment. And so um, I, I didn't like the idea of being isolated um, to the point that we couldn't have the human contact, which I guess is something that you take for granted when you have it all the time, right? And now it's something saying that you can't. It's one thing when I don't want contact because I don't want to, but to say you can't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't go out, you can't go here. That was right. a whole different thing. Right. <laughs> for me, so you, felt, you felt a little bit like an inmate. 
Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Preaching, <laughs> preaching freedom while you felt captive. Exactly, solitary confinement, you know? Yeah, I get it. Bishop Crozier, how was it for you? Well, Bishop, it's sort of like, I agree with what Pastor Faison said, but in a lot of ways, it sent me back to my roots because um, it's sort of like now it's not inviting necessarily inviting people to church. It's inviting people to Jesus because hurting people is, is a consistent. People are always hurting, and we get to go back now to the absolute grassroots of you have to have a word. What COVID did is it leveled the playing field. Mm. Now it's not a mega church. It's not a small church. It's you and that screen. Right. And you have to have something to deliver. And so to me, it really is an opportunity to connect to people and point people to Jesus. So I, my, I, my heart hurts. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you about. My heart hurts for the people who are dealing with loss, who's deal who are dealing with unemployment, you know, the death of loved ones, and having to minister to them through that moment. But it really does give us opportunity to point people to Jesus. You bring up a really good point, and it's, you bring up something that I have been thinking a lot about. Uh, the people who come back to our services will not be the same people who left and understanding that they have been through a considerable amount of trauma, whether they have lost loved ones or whether they've lost jobs or whether they've lost homes or whether they've had to uh, just deal with the day-to-day -day uncertainty. Uh, there's a certain amount of trauma that comes from that. And it begs the question, um, I think everybody thinks, you know, the vaccine is coming and and you know it's going to be a magic pill. We're going to take the pill, and everything's going to go back to normal. And and people are going to fly again. They're going to go to service again. And, and maybe to some degree that's true, but to a, to a greater degree, uh, I have learned that you cannot go through uh, that level of trauma and come back the same. And furthermore, I have learned that there are no do overs in life that you can, you can come to the same spot and bring the same people together uh, next year that you did this year, but you can't create the same experience because each experience is tailor-made. Give us this day uh, our daily bread. Each one is tailor-made for that day. This is the day that the Lord has made. There will never be another day like this day. And understanding that and being prepared for that means that our approach to ministry may have to accommodate people that have already been traumatized and don't need to be further traumatized coming back to a uh, a judgmental uh, church, an angry pastor, a frustrated leader, a demanding situation exacerbating the fact that the person can't function like they once did because they've been uh, become uh, traumatized, strange emotions, self-medication, uh, domestic violence, uh, repressed anger, insomnia, depression, mood swings. All of those are, are happening to a broader base of people, not to mention the people who are already wrestling with emotional illness in the first place. This opens up a window for a whole different level of uh, of the absence of normalcy, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, when I first started in ministry, I was in uh, in the Charlotte airport, in the U.S. Airlines section of the Charlotte airport to catch flight because, you know, when you live in Charleston, if you want to go to heaven, you have to either go through Pittsburgh or Charlotte. <laughs> and I guess it's still like that. It was back then. And uh, now it's Atlanta or Charlotte. Oh, really? Okay, now you got Atlanta or Charlotte. Okay, uh, and and so uh, I ran into a, a bishop who walked up to me, and he looked so sad. He said, "Oh, he said you've lost something that uh, you'll never be able to regain." And Bishop Campbell, and I said to Bishop Campbell, "I said, what is that, Bishop?" He just shook his head and said, normalcy. Wow. And walked sadly away. Wow. 
And it took me years to fully understand the magnitude of what he said. Yeah. Uh, I think what we lost this year is normalcy. And normalcy is not valuable until you lose it. <laughs> but when you lose it and you have to adapt to uncertainty, uh, that's a whole new bag of worms. And to adapt to it to the point that it becomes a new normal for you, mm. you know, uh, whether you're sitting around holiday dinner tables and a seat is empty, that used to be filled, or a trip is no longer necessary because the person you were going to see isn't there. The absence of those normalcies uh, create stress and trauma and uh, a feeling of being off balance, right. you know. Right. Uh, and then uh, as they come back into church, I think we have to think strategically uh, about how we can best serve and facilitate people who have emotional problems and don't have a name for it, haven't been diagnosed, ashamed of it, uncomfortable with it, right. don't even know that it's an emotional problem, think that they have a reason to be angry or bitter and don't really realize that this is coming from a year of, of trauma from uh, George Floyd on down to uh, Tatiana Jefferson to Armand Arbery, the images that have been pressed into our head, uh, the tornadoes, mm -hmm. the fires, uh, job disparities, the health disparities. Um, at this point, 300,000 people dead uh the images of all of that i've had people calling screaming on the phone crying because they couldn't even say goodbye to their mother or hold her hand or kiss her spouse goodbye funerals socially distanced graveside services all of those things don't sound like much but they're therapies for us it's how our souls recalibrate to loss with the absence of that, there's going to be uh, a, a lot of uh, difficult things. So I've been thinking about how do we get ahead of that and how do we prepare for it uh, sermonically, uh, experientially, when they come back to service, uh, creating environments for socialization. Uh, you know, socialization might become bigger than sermons. <laughs> you know, they might not be dying to come back and hear you preach because they've been hearing you preach the whole time, but they're dying for connectivity. Exactly. exactly. You know, so how do we rearrange the service so that those needs are met? Those are just some of the things I've been thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. You know what is like what you're saying? I really get it. And so you have been one of those resources, not only to myself and Pastor Faison, but to so many pastors. Well, I'll just call Bishop Jakes. I'll just unload on Bishop Jakes. Exactly. So my question is, what does someone like you do when you have basically people from the whole world, right. news, media, everybody, pulling from you? How do you get through something like this? I have an inner circle. I keep an inner circle. Uh, I have a spiritual father uh, who mentors me in some ways just by virtue of the fact of him being 21 years older than me, he kind of forecasts for me what the next season might look like. Mm -hmm. Glimpses into your future is mentoring and, and to see what that looks like in, in flesh and blood. Uh, but then I have other people mentor me about other things, uh, uh, health and wellness, uh, investments, uh, job opportunities. The notion that you get one mentor and they do everything is erroneous as your life gets bigger. You get different people who mentor different areas of your life and you, and that becomes a circle. And then as it relates to people that you pour into, the higher you get, the smaller your circle has to be. Mm -hmm. wow. The reason the pyramids are still standing is because they're not top heavy. Yeah. If you invert the pyramid, it would fall over. Right. Right, 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 right. The only way it survives is as the higher, the more you point upward, the smaller your circumference has to be in awesome. order to survive. So I have an inner circle like Jesus had an inner circle. Yeah. He had the three, he had the 12, he had the 70, and then the 5,000. Mm. Yeah. So that becomes a pyramid of ministry. And understanding uh, 
<clears throat> who are those persons that you can keep it real with? Right. Uh, who don't require you being on duty 24 mm seven, -hmm. who have not fallen in love with your image rather than who you are as a person, uh, who can absorb the fact that you're in a bad mood today right. or that you want to call and vent. <laughs> you know, you, everybody needs to be able to call somebody and vent and still be respected in the morning. <laughs> wow. Yes, you yes, know, yes. those things are, I think are very, very important. But I think we'll rob the audience if we don't uh, take advantage of something you all did without me. I I heard you all been talking about me behind my back. Yeah, we got caught <laughs> talking about you, man. Yeah, yeah, I heard you all been talking about me behind my back. So uh, it it was interesting to listen at your perspectives of what my teaching styles were like. Oh my! And uh, me being hard on you <laughs> coming up, sir. Yes, yeah, you had you had to justify that a little bit. I thought I was real easy. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> it wasn't easy at all. We had to take it. Yeah. Don't make it. <laughs> give, give me an example. Oh wow. Uh how many? I could give you so many, but but because <laughs> I was always sort of the problem child, always found a way getting into stuff, you know. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> getting into stuff. But one of the things that you would always stress to me was how important it was that I maintain uh, who I was, uh, both publicly and privately, right? And so <laughs> I can remember, this is probably a weird illustration, but I can remember very strongly one time ministering at our church, one of the early times I preached at our church, power of God fell, you know, it was a great time, all that sort of thing. And it was a snowy day and I came outside, and, you know, the saints were shouting, the word came, and all that kind of stuff went forth. I walked right outside and started throwing snowballs, <laughs> just playing in the snow. And you stopped me and said, don't lose your anointing. It was just the weirdest thing. It was like, don't lose your anointing. And then you went to explaining how important that was, not just in that moment, but how it was in life. That, you know, we have a responsibility and a mantle uh, in front of people that you can't be busy playing and lose that influence. You know, and it, you know, it struck me real hard at first because I was just, I wanted to be normal, even though I was just starting in ministry. I wanted to hold on to that normalcy of being who I was. And you made me understand early that this was a calling and a mantle that you had to carry. I kind of remember that. <laughs> remember that? Yeah. And I yeah. always remember that to this day, you know, when I get ready to think about something, you know, that, that voice comes back to me, don't, don't lose your anointing. <laughs> Well, you, you know, it's a dangerous thing to become common with people yes. that you just got through laying hands on. Yes. That's and what it then, was. then part of people's ability to, to receive you is based on perception. The Bible said of the Shunammite woman, she perceived that he was a man of God. Yeah. Uh, the woman at the well, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Yeah. That perception is just as powerful as prophecy. Yes. When that perception goes, you can still be anointed, but not be effective because I no longer perceive you as being able to speak into my life. Yes. And often the enemy, if he can't destroy your anointing, he will destroy your perception. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because if the perception is gone, I know a lot of people that are anointed and, and not effective because people don't perceive them as being uh able to speak into their life and that's wow. that's what the enemy most often takes mm -hmm. uh in actuality he can't really take your anointed right but he can take people's perception of you being anointed yes sir and leave you ineffective because the anointing comes to make you effective mm -hmm. and uh and the and he can leave you ineffective because they don't perceive you and you could get up and say the same thing that the other man of God or woman of God just said, but it doesn't have the impact because they don't perceive you on that level. Exactly. In the, in, as anointed as Jesus was, there were certain cities that he could not do any great works mm -hmm. because they did not perceive him to be a, a man of God. And if people don't perceive you, they can't receive you. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So. So wow. that, that's, that's the reason for that. It was valuable. Bishop, I have, go ahead. It was valuable. I still carry that, that it was a simple thought, 
but it had profound impact on the way I approach uh, ministry and life and responsibility and everything, you know? Yeah. I'm sorry, Bishop. What were you saying? No, that's all right. I have a question for you, um, Bishop Jakes, be because you referred to um, Bishop Watkins. And I always try to explain to people leadership sort of like the centurion mm -hmm. who, when he was talking to Jesus, he said, I'm a man in authority, but I'm also a man under authority. What has fascinated me about you is you are the great Bishop T.D. Jakes, but to this day, you still serve and honor Bishop Watkins. You still have a pastor that you are in and under submission to. Could you talk about that just for a little bit? Uh, that's a great privilege. It's a, it's a great honor. Uh, I will be a father the rest of my life, irrevocably. Whether good or bad, I will always be a father. But I will seldom get to be a son. Mm. And what a gift it is that enables me to be more effective as a father to take the break of being a son. Mm. So you, you, you only lead as well as you serve. Uh, you, you, you see, if you don't if you don't serve well, you don't lead well because you lose empathy with the people under you, because you're always in charge. You spout out orders without understanding what it takes to get that done. You have unreasonable expectations of people. You treat them in a way that you would not treat yourself because you no longer see yourself as a servant, and Jesus received it, perceived himself as a servant, he girded himself with a towel and started washing feet in front of his disciples, because to get to do that adds to your glory. Mm -hmm. It adds to your glory. And I think that's something that's missing from this generation, uh, because they're not taught that. Some, in part because all of them have not been fathered, you know, but that goes back to me, my father having me loading trucks uh, for a janitorial service. Take your hands out your pocket. And load them boxes up in that truck. Get that truck up in there. What are you doing there? Let's just stand there looking at it. I hated it. Now I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, it gave me a work ethic. It, yeah. it, it gave me somebody to be submitted to. Uh, men don't feel any more love than they are disciplined. Wow. Uh, our love language is discipline. Because when you discipline me, that means you care about me. If you just let me do whatever I want to do and you don't say anything back to me, that means I, you didn't notice me. I don't matter. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. But if you care enough to get up in my face, yes, sir. that that feeds me on another level. Yeah. I, well, Pastor Face and I both know you love us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got the stars. I got the whelps. I am well loved. Believe, believe me. <laughs> You've been well loved. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, for Bishop Watkins, uh, I know how to do church. I know how to run an organization. In some ways, I've mentored him in regards to some of the contemporary things that are available today that weren't available in his day. Uh, I, I know how to deal with the business aspects. I didn't always. He taught me things I didn't know, uh, how to handle money, how to make investments, how to get your bills paid, you know. Uh, he mentored me how to stay married. He was married 46 years till his wife had not died. I, I watched him go through the different seasons of life. We don't get those models often. To get to go serve somebody and be a son and not have to worry about it's the prayer team ready. Did the service start on time? Has the gas bill been paid? Are the mics right? Is the lighting good? Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And just just serving is relaxing. Yeah. Because you just do as you're told. Yes, sir. You know, I prophesied as I was commanded. Suddenly there was a shake. I didn't know whether it would live or not. You know, that's the servitude allows you to just obey. Mm -hmm. And uh and for me that has been therapeutic. Not to mention the fact I genuinely love him. I think that's the part that we miss. Whether we lead or serve, if we don't learn to love, then it's just a form and a fashion and an action 
with a with a other motive. Mm -hmm. But real love makes you do what you do, expecting nothing in return. <laughs> wow. You know, I expect nothing in return. Yeah. You know, I have absolutely nothing in return. Uh, you see, I, I think that's what makes you amazing. Right. Because of the level that you have achieved. And then to see you, I mean, I've seen you You're right. come in and say, what do you need me to do? Yeah. And then you go do it. Yeah. And for you to look at him the way that we look at you, I mean, just with total respect and like, what it is absolutely amazing. Let me tell you a funny story about being here. Uh, <clears throat> so he was in Miami and, and the hurricanes were coming mm -hmm. and the airports were shutting down and he was stuck down there and he couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. And I was going bananas. We got to get you out of there. I was calling all my friends in Miami, drive over there and pick him up. Drive him to the closest airport that is open and get him out of there. Whatever needs to be paid, I'll pay him. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll do that. Get a helicopter, lady, because because I've been through Katrina. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was a flashback, and he was right on the water. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I think he was maybe 79. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm just going bananas. And he said, well, he said, uh, there's nothing I can do about it. He said, uh, I can't drive because they've run out of gas and uh, I can't fly because they shut down the airports and uh, I'm just going to go take a bubble bath. <laughs> this is what I thought about killing him. <laughs> I thought, I thought, I'm going to kill you and tell God you died, okay? I'm just going to kill you, okay? So I, I'm just flying off the, the handle, you know? I just, 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 I'm really, truly vexed with him because he doesn't seem to be alarmed about it. Right. And, and guess what he told me? He said, you need to, I'm going to get this tub. You need to go read Psalms 91. <laughs> I was so bad. I was so bad. You could have fried an egg on the top of my head. Uh, I mean, you could have literally fried an egg on top of my head because I'm I'm scared is why I'm mad. Right. Right. What 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 women don't understand about men is most of the time we're angry. The anger is camouflage for another emotion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So true. so I didn't want to be scared. So I'm mad to keep from showing that I'm afraid. And I got off the phone. I was fuming. I was walking through. I was fuming, <laughs> and uh, and a song came on. I think it was the Today Show, and and the guy was a country western guy was singing uh, "Angels." Uh, I got angels watching over me. Man, and and tears welled up in my eyes because I knew it was God telling me he was right. Calm mm -hmm. down. Everything's gonna be okay. The hurricane is headed right for Miami. Right. It made a U-turn and started it up the Eastern Panhandle. Wow. wow. A complete U-turn, totally unpredictable. Everybody is fleeing Miami. And, and it, it's as if it hit a wall. Wow. <laughs> See, wow. he had prayed about it. Right. And, and it, hit a, it was like it hit a wall and made a U-turn and went up the other way. That's amazing. And a couple of hours later, he called me. He said, where, guess where I'm at? I said, where are you? He said, in the mall eating a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I, I, I tell you, I thought now, you know, I'm going to jail. Right, you all upset. Yeah, I'm all upset, but he told me I needed to read Psalms 91, but, but he has something that if you could bottle it, it would be priceless. Mm -hmm. I have never, ever seen him distraught. I have seen him face horrific news with measured response in such in the most amazing way. And, and I aspire to have that. I'm better, but I don't have it like he has it. Yeah. And it's not that he's not bothered by it, but there's there's certain spaces he never gives up. The death of his wife, the death of his son, there through every I've seen him in every situation imaginable. Uh, you know, I, I, I preached his brother's funeral. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I was with him when he preached his father's funeral. I'm standing right beside him, fanning him while he's preaching. 
yeah. uh, up 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 near Beards Ford, just fanning him while he's free. I've been with him in every situation, you know, and uh, there there's a, a peace that he has. And so no matter who you are in terms of status, there's still an area that you can grow from, that you can learn from, that you can evolve in. And I, I think when the Bible said it's not good to think of yourself more highly than you are, I see people with far less than that I have accomplished who are much more arrogant. Wow. Wow. For such poor reasons. Wow. So just that thing. What are you doing? It, it is not you, it's, it's, you, you know, what why would you why are you so far above uh serving? Mm -hmm. One of the things that the old school taught us, you served. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I came in and told Bishop Wilson I was at convocation. I was about 20 some years old. Yes, I, I just started pastoring uh, Derek uh, had just joined my church. Yes. So I was about 24, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. I was a pastor yeah. at a church. Lord right. God, I'm a pastor. And uh, service was getting ready to start and there was nobody there to play. And Bishop Wilson asked me to go play the, the, the organ. One, I don't play the organ well, I play piano. Two, uh, I'm a pastor, <laughs> you know? I told him, I said, uh, well, I'm a pastor, Bishop. And he turned around and looked at me and said, who plays in your church? Oh. I dropped my head, I said, I do. He said, well, what's wrong with here? I went to the organ, I didn't turn him a back word. This is where submission comes in. I didn't turn him a back word. I went to the organ, jumped on the organ, started playing until somebody else came. Yes, sir. Those were life lessons mm -hmm. uh, that taught you how to balance how you perceive yourself and whatever title they call you against what you're really supposed to be. And I think that Bishop Watkins and my submission to him helps keep me balanced. Uh, it gives me much more than it takes away. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gives me normalcy. Uh, it gives me servitude. It gives me a chance to be a son again. Uh, I like to serve. Uh, and really, the only job that God has open is slave. Wow. That was the only job, you know, is it, servants. Mm -hmm. you know? So we're just different levels of service. Yes, sir. But they're, 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 he, he's got the master part covered. Mm -hmm. So the only job opening is slave. And if you apply, then you gotta be willing to do whatever you have to do. Paul said that he was a slave. Mm -hmm. And he wrote most of the epistles in the New Testament. And yet he defined himself as a, as a servant, as a slave. Jesus girded himself with a towel. Mm -hmm. Joseph served his brethren. You see, well, all throughout the Bible, you see a constant line of service yeah. mm -hmm. and you both are pastoring you know that uh, pastoring means serving yes sir. You, you know absolutely uh, but you're not gonna get past my original question uh dr crozier uh, <laughs> <laughs> you and your mind my mind is still good my I'm mind. Slipping, right? slipping. No, no, no. my knees are getting stiff but my mind is still good <laughs> I you, you, you have your mom's mind. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, that's so funny. We go back, you remember my mother. In fact, you both do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I asked you to give us, give me an example of where I was hard on you. Um, the, the thing is, see, I came from a church, as you know, Bishop Jakes. I had a woman pastor, Pastor Johnson, and she really was a great woman of God, but she was a mother. Mm -hmm. And she witnessed to so many of us on the streets. Mm -hmm. So her approach was, I'm just happy these young men are saved. Right. So we could come to church late. You know what I'm saying again? We could pretty much, you know, come late. And, you know, you're shaking people's hands and all like that. <clears throat> and it's like she was just happy we were there. So when I came to the Temple of Faith, mm -hmm. um, which was the church you were pastoring here in uh, Cross Lanes. This wasn't me, but I watched someone else come late. 
<laughs> and try to come up to the uh the podium area after service had started. Now you talking about being able to fry an egg on your head, it was literally like smoke <laughs> was coming out. Now, so I'm not going to, because you're laughing and you know it's true, so I'm not going to say what was said, but I never attempted that. Right, right, right. But what you told us was, because, you know, back then, we would even, you know, how you would go over, preach too long, say too long, and then say it was the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, the Holy Ghost right. took over. You know, the Spirit took over. Yeah. And what you told us was in, in being such a visionary, you said if you were on TV, you would have to stop. There it is. If you were on the radio mm -hmm. and they went to commercial, you would stop in time. Mm -hmm. So while you're here, you're going to start on time. <laughs> you're going to stop on time. It's just your your regimen to discipline yes, yeah. that I still have today. Mm -hmm. And it's still sort of odd to people where they say services want to start at 11 or business meeting or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they don't know to be there because I even know now, like if we're in a car with you, yeah. if we're supposed to leave at a certain time, <laughs> It's, it's, and if you, I mean, to this day, if you're not there, you're going to get left. Yes, yes, yes. To this very moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, I noticed both of you were on time for this Zoom. Oh, yeah, early. <laughs> <laughs> you better. This very knew what it was. Yeah, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't take it, man. I really Remember can't. the old saints, they had a song, Get Right or Get Left. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Right. I literally have left people at the hotel and <laughs> on the church and had, they had to get a taxi. Trust me, I know. <laughs> yeah, because when it's time to go, it's time to, it's go. Time time to, go. to go. Yes, sir. And, uh, and uh, that discipline is, I think the thing that I am most grateful to my father for, if he were alive today, is his discipline. Had he not been as hard on me as he was, yes, sir. my life would have killed me. Yes, sir. It, I wouldn't have been able to stand up to the pressure and the responsibility, but between my father's discipline and my mother's tenacity, and my mother didn't let you fall apart, you could fall apart if you wanted to. She would slap your face and say, get yourself together. And now that sounds abusive now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but today I can hear her voice in my head saying, get yourself together. Yeah, yeah. Stand up, yeah. I wish you would, stand up. Yeah. You know, see, there was no room with her for you just, oh, I just, I just can't, I just, get yourself together. Wow. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that, that's uh, down in me and listening at you all talk, you know, about me, you sound like my kids say things like that mm -hmm. about me, so mm -hmm. I can't deny it, it must be right. true, you know, but uh, it, it was interesting nonetheless uh, to hear you say that. Uh, Pastor Fraser, the first time you heard me teach on the tabernacle, we were in Smithers. Mm -hmm. I, I had those overhead projections. I remember that. Yeah, and I was teaching on the tabernacle, okay. and I was teaching on it, Wayne, I was going through the whole Yes. The whole thing, piece mm -hmm. by piece. I taught on everything. The the bowls, the vows, the trumpets, the, mm -hmm. the the furniture, the outer court, the inner court, the holy, the holy daylight, uh divine light, uh biblical revelatory light. I taught on all of it, even yes, to yes. the dirt on the ground. Yes. Uh, you know, that the shame of your nakedness shall not appear before me. You know, that God had peaked up under their skirts. I, I remember it. Uh, yes. If my people now saw me in that building, mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't yet fully carpeted it. Mm -hmm. We had that press board floor. I remember that. You remember that press board floor? Well, yeah. And and I was teaching yeah. with that. Uh, <laughs> we were shouting the dust would come up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that's what happened to me in the pandemic. You know, I preached to an empty room a, a, a yes. part of my life, you know. Yes. So when the devil threw that, I thought, oh, you hit the sweet spot. Right. 
because I would run a complete revival in this room by myself. Oh my God. <laughs> Lay hands in the air and everything, <laughs> you know, shout, dance, fall out, raise the offering and go home right. by myself because it was never about the crowd for me. Yeah. It's never about the crowd, it's about the text. Yeah. Yeah. Today, people, they love the crowd and let the text watch. Yes, yes, yes. When we came along, we loved the text and let the crowd watch. Yes. Yes. So whether you're watching through a camera or whether you're sitting there in the seat is immaterial to me. The text triumphs over the moment. Mm. Yeah, the, text, the text is the whole moment. I mean, in the back of my mind, even while I'm sitting here talking to you, yes. my text for tomorrow is in my head, yes. teasing me, yeah, flirting yeah. with me. Just, just, this, this, right now, I mean, right this right. very moment, it's, it's, it's just, just all around me, all up in my head. Yes. And so, and then I'll give birth to it and I'll, I'll get released from it and, and go forward. Mm -hmm. I think it would help because the audience, for the most part, that will see this can't imagine dust coming up, people shouting in a church. Yeah. Or 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 they can't imagine the fact that I helped nail the floor down. Oh, yes, you, sir. You remember building that pulpit? Yes, sir. Or or the old church, uh, Mon in Montgomery, uh, all those different color pews, different types of pews, and different chairs, and the nails in them would come up and stick you, you mm -hmm. know, because they were just miscellaneous pews we gotten from somewhere everywhere. Oh yeah. People can't imagine me in a place like that. If if we squeeze tight, we might could get 80 people in there. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, you know, the only time we had that big a crowd was uh was when we had the back to the Bible conference. Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna tell you a story, see if you remember this. Okay. Uh an evangelist from Atlanta, mm -hmm. I think her name was Bernice Clark came to run a revival at the Temple of Faith in Montgomery. Okay. And she said, she prophesied that God was going to give us 500 souls. Yes, I do. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. She yes. prophesied that God was going to give us 500 So She said yes, 500, that, which was unimaginable. I couldn't even, I couldn't even conceive no. having 500 people. It was just, it was just unthinkable. Yes. So I'm, I'm driving them home that night. And so it's me and Sarita and the boys mm -hmm. and Derek and Brother Morris, Michael Morris, and, and Bill Lester. And we're all piled up in this one little raggedy 67 Valiant uh -huh. going back from Montgomery. And Brother Morris said to me, it was quiet, yeah. you know, because they've been one of them services right. that make right. you drive home quiet. quiet. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Brother Morris said, Pastor. If the Lord give us 500 souls, wow. where are we going to put them? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? I remember that. Absolutely remember that. Absolutely remember that. Yeah, he, had, he had a point, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where are we going to put them at? I, I, I had no answer. I said, I don't know. I couldn't conceive yeah. having 500 souls. And if, if all of my music department comes together, it's probably about 700 of us. Golly. Wow. Just in the music department alone. Absolutely incredible. And, and I couldn't even, I came from a place where I couldn't imagine it. So for the pastor who's, who has no members or few members, or he has to drive them home after church, I can talk to him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the pastor who has so much staff that he's doing uh, end of the year bonuses and reconciliation statements for uh, his team because the year is coming to an end and he's he's doing uh, business other businesses he's doing taxes and property taxes and, and all of that I can relate to him too yes, sir. I can relate to the pastor who is doing major acquisitions and I can relate to the pastor who's uh, carrying his family and friends home from service, locking up the door, yeah. making sure the light's out, yeah. making turning down the, the, the heat from the stove. We had a cook stove mm -hmm. in the back. You ought to remember that cook stove. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the back of the church, that was the heat we had. 
in the league. Yeah. Uh, those, those, my my world today can't imagine my world then, and my world then can't imagine my world today. Wow. So talk about some of those early years. Well, I, I'm going to share a story now. Do you remember uh, driving me home from church, as you often did, over to Smithers, yep. and riding past that, that movie theater? Yep. And getting, and getting so excited, you jumped out the car to yep. see that old <laughs> broken down movie theater, you know, with, with, with like holes in the roof and, you know, rats all through it and the <laughs> boards was all rotted, you know? Yeah. You looked at that, that place like it was, like you found gold. <laughs> yeah. Like you found gold and went after that thing every day up there, painting yes. the walls, yep. bringing in the sheetrock. And, and I was no contractor and most of us didn't. It was volunteers. Yeah. We volunteered, we volunteered painted, putting in a lot of stuff like that. And, um, but when you walked into that place, it was like it was like you walked into the Potter's house to you yeah. at the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was bigger than what we had in Smithers, but yeah. it was still like, I mean, your eyes just lit up. You know, it was like stop the car, jumped out. You know, and look at this place that it was on a dark street right yeah. across the, the street from the railroad track. The train yes. was coming there. <laughs> I see it right now. <laughs> the rusted I, sign on the front. Everything. Yeah. I, I see it like we're there right this minute. Yeah. And I remember leaving the car in the middle of the street. Yeah. And running out and seeing this building and thinking it was amazing. Yeah. And it was the first time I took the members in there, one of my members threw up. <laughs> and I, I didn't even turn back to see why. Yeah. She, she threw up because the smell was so bad and it looked so bad that they thought it was disgusting. And, and all I could see was what it could be. Mm -hmm. That's all I could see. That's how you know you're a visionary. Mm -hmm. All I could see was what it could be. See it. And it became what I saw. We believed you. Yeah. We did, I mean, we didn't see it, but you did, clearly. You, you remember when I was running up the stairs and fell through the steps <laughs> and kept on running? I fell, Bishop Kroger, I fell through the steps. This is Smithers. I fell through the steps and go up to the balcony. Yes. You know, and, and I fell through the steps and my legs was kicking up <laughs> under the because I was still going. That that drive, that yeah. drive, yeah. that relentless drive brought me here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That relentless, I'll carry the, the sheet rock. I'll get off work, work eight hours a day. I worked for Union Carbide, get off work and drive up to Smithers and start hammering mm -hmm. and, and doing all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that the way I had developed such good staff is that I worked first. I, they, we would have a conference. I would be down there moving chairs around, organizing the way I wanted. Gerald and them would come down and help me move chairs around. Gradually, they pushed me off to the side and eventually took over. And you work, good leadership works itself out of a job. You can't get a title and let it go to your head. Wow. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you can't just teach servitude. Yes, sir. You have to be a servant. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, if, sir. You, if you be what you're teaching, you will see what you taught. Wow. Whoa. I hear you, sir. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, if sir. you be it. Yes, sir. Then you'll see it. Yes, sir. But you can't teach me to be something that you didn't model in front of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think that brings about a change. Uh, uh, Bishop Grove, you remember back then we was going to everybody's church to preach? Mm -hmm. And uh, we we go down to Sister Mabel Page's church, and it would be all these cars lined up, and we'd be leading these cars down there to go preach for her, and then she'd come preach for me and uh, Pastor Rosine Jackson, and yes. I, I remember I remember all of those people, uh, Bishop Strader, mm -hmm. and all of those people. We'd go over there and preach for them, and and, and go up in the holler, Wilson Holler. It's Worth Avenue, but we called it Wilson Holler. Do they? Is it still there? Yes, sir. It's, it, it is still there. It is still there. Bishop, now I have a question for you or something I would like for you to talk about. You taught me a story 
that I actually told my, my daughter this story, that you said you were a young boy and you one time you took your Bible mm. and you walked across the street telling God oh, yeah. how much you trusted him. Yeah, with my eyes closed. Yeah, I walked across the street with my eyes closed. I do not suggest that anybody listening do this. <laughs> okay. uh, but I told God that was how much I trusted him. I closed my eyes and walked across the street, uh, uh, down the block and across the street with my eyes closed. And I told him, this is how much I trust you. And this is how much I'm, I want to trust you. Wow. Uh, and it's been that all my life. Yeah. Uh, not not seeing what was next, mm -hmm. but feet still moving toward it, mm -hmm. not knowing what I'd have to pay for it, but not afraid to go after it. Mm -hmm. uh, That's amazing. <clears throat> it 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 was in me. I was so honored that he would ask somebody like me to do something like this for him. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm still like that. I, I can't, it's unbelievable that, that he would ask me to do this. Awesome. You know, I tried to talk him out of it. I said, this is not gonna work good. <laughs> you know, uh, get somebody else. Uh, what an honor yeah. to, to, to be drafted into his service and and uh to be asked to do something that i had no idea was going to go like this because i would have fought harder <laughs> i would have fought harder trying to get away from it uh but just to be in this role at all was uh such such an honor and uh, that's gone yeah. We don't see much of that now. Uh, you know, I have taught, preached on Sundays during the pandemic, preached in empty rooms during the pandemic. When things got worse, I started teaching Bible class from, from sitting right here during the pandemic, feeding the flock, doing uh, Facebook lives, trying to comfort the people, Instagram lives. Uh, confronting issues, writing op-eds, feeding hungry people every week. We fed thousands and thousands of families food every week. But Derek could tell you I was cooking on Elvira Road and feeding people there. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's, it has to come from inside. Yeah. It, can't, it can't be assumed. It, it has to be born out of you, out of who you, who you are, yeah. not what title you have. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what, Bishop, I, I think the great privilege and me and um, Crozer talked about this last night was um, being able to watch you shoulder that before there was any notoriety. Like, like the attitude that you expressed about serving, you know, your spiritual father and, and, your approach to caring about people and ministering and serving and approaching the text was the way you were even before there was anybody to watch. And, and I feel privileged to be able to watch you while it was in the infantile stages to really get a feel for what real ministry looks like. There it is. Yeah. What does it really look like? You know, a lot of what we see to your point is a lot of the, uh, I call it the, the tapestry of ministry, mm -hmm. the drapes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the things that really make it what it is, is what's behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. And and more than anything, it was the behind the curtain stuff, like we're talking about tonight, that gave me a real picture for this is what ministry is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. it, that nucleus, that, that approach to it, mm -hmm. uh, the tenacity to look at a building like that and, and imagine what it could be and moving chairs and you know the things that you're saying you know but um that to me is like the great takeaway of 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 knowing you mm -hmm. you know the great takeaway of walking with you is that beneath all the things that we are enthralled with is a person who really 
does love God and really approaches ministry like it matters. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? I don't yeah. know if I'm making sense of it. Yeah, 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 you make sense. <laughs> yeah, like it really it, matters. It's, it, it absolutely it. matters. Yeah. It, 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 it still matters. Yes, sir. Yeah, it still matters. Uh, 40, 44 years later, I've been preaching 44 years. That's unbelievable. <laughs> 44 years. And they said I wouldn't last two weeks. <laughs> uh, they did. They said I wouldn't last two weeks. Yeah. They said I'd be back in the streets in two weeks. Uh, and 44 years later, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, most of the people who said that are, are dead. Wow. And, uh, and I'm still here by the grace of God. Absolutely by the grace of God. Crozier, what, what is the big takeaway for you, Bishop, when you look at uh, your experiences uh, under my covering? What did you get out it, of it? It is the tenacity. I mean, there's, there's so many things, but I think at the, at the core, at the root of it, it's like you can't quit. Yeah. It's like you, you preach the sermon entitled, you will win if you don't quit. <laughs> and ultimately, I think that's it. It's like, no matter what, like you taught me to be a man, even behind the pulpit in business, it's like you shoulder, you shoulder, it. you take it and yeah. you go. And, and that's what I'm saying. I just so much admire and respect that. And then to balance it with compassion, yeah. you have this uncanny ability to be strong mm -hmm. but then to be loving mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. and it's 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 like it's a gift from god to be able to chastise people and they still love you even more mm -hmm. you know i've seen you um let people go and they're hugging you and crying and all like that you know what i'm saying again it's like how does this man do this you know what i'm saying it's it's just amazing, but to me, I just want to make sure, Bishop, that you know that you really are a living legend. You really are an icon, yeah. and people really do, Pastor Faison and myself, just are representative, yes, that sir. you really are loved, man. You are a gift from God yeah. to the body of Christ, and I, I tell you this privately, but I just want to say it in the national platform because this is what people really want to tell you. We love you. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you. Uh, that's a lot to absorb because uh, I know you mean it. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a real place and I, I, can, I can feel it. And I, I, I really appreciate it. And I, and I know you mean it. I, I ran into, I was in Huntington. <clears throat> I was in Huntington uh, to do a funeral. And I ran into one of your members and they were asking me about a movie. And uh, they said, somebody said that you did that movie. And I said, no, no, I didn't. They said, I know, oh, no, I knew it wasn't your movie. I said, you did? He said, yeah, because if it had been your movie, Pastor would have made all of us go see it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He said, any, any movie you come out with, he loads all his whole church up and we we all got to go see it. He that's said that when Pastor didn't load us up in the car, he said that's not a TD Jakes. That's movie. right. <laughs> no, that, that's the absolute truth. That is the absolute truth. If you are having something, we're going to support it. Yes. That's my way of telling you thank you. That's my way of saying because you have been there for me. Mm -hmm. At my lowest points, yeah. you have been there. There are things that. I've told you that I honestly have never told another soul. Yeah. And again, it's things like that I learned from you, that when people tell things to their pastor, right. I'm supposed to take it to the grave. Absolutely. You go anywhere. I feel so strongly about it. Yeah. I feel so strongly about it. I don't even talk to my wife. That's right. You know, because if you wanted to talk to her, you'd have got her on the phone. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't do that and i think that's that's very very integrity is very very important and uh 
it's it's important to me to talk to you because most of the people that that our audience sees now are people who are new sons mm -hmm. but but uh you remember me with the jerry curl yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. you remember me when i was staying at martha johnson's house and and, and preaching my wife and i talked Talk about laying up in the bed upstairs, uh, giggling in the bed. Uh, young people staying in the pastor's house uh, with Pastor Martha Johnson. Uh, always loved her. Yeah, always yeah. loved her. Yeah. I remember you would preach, and you literally would leave a spot where you sweat. It would like be a spot on the floor. But when you used to come to town, it really was the equivalent of Earth, Wind, and Fire or the Commodores coming. <laughs> Cause it's like, like Bishop, like back then it was Elder Jakes. It's like Elder Jakes hey, is coming. Okay. Elder Jakes is coming. Yeah. And we could not wait to get to church cause you were coming and you would come in like Mike Tyson. You know what I'm saying? You would come in, but it was business, bro. You would go to, you would go to work. And the first sermon I ever heard you preach was entitled Grace. That's all. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Yes, yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, yes. I got cold chills. <laughs> Boy, I got chills all over me. I remember it. Yeah. 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 I, that's that that's so amazing to me. Tell us a little bit about your your ministries and what your vision are is and 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 what what you believe in God to do in your respective cities. Well, in Nashville, uh, one of the things that COVID did was make us put a greater focus on outreach more so than in reach. And one of the things that I've been feverishly doing is finding needs in the city that we could put our arms around. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a food drive where we uh, gave away 1,400 boxes of food to families that were in need. Wow. And we did it twice. We did it twice. Uh, and in between, we delivered boxes to neighboring communities that were, that were there. And so we've been talking to the, the police department, to the mayor, to ask them, uh, where are the needs in your city? And where can we put our finger? And so where I see our church going is, and, and that, the amazing thing is that people who uh, normally wouldn't have come to church or are starting to lose interest in church because we've been out so long, have been fired up about getting ready to get out there and serve and minister and work and their party and having a good time while we're feeding people and serving people. And so uh, I see our church moving more towards being mission-minded. I, I, I don't see us just pastoring a small community. I see us pastoring uh, this entire city. Uh, that may be a little bit ambitious, but um, one of the things I said to one of the officials is that uh, as you run into needs in this city, whether they are uh, with youth, with young people, uh, domestic violence, with crime, whatever it is, housing, all those issues, we want to be that church that you look to, to partner with you in helping you to meet those needs. And that's a real thing for me, uh, being part of the fabric of this community, as opposed to just sitting as an isolated church on the hill. We want to be all in the trenches, all involved, wrapped up, interwoven into the Nashville community. And that's where I see our church. Uh, we're, we're, in, we're in Rivergate Parkway, actually in Goodlettsville. Uh, which is just outside of Nashville, probably about 20 minutes away, 20 miles from, you know, Nashville proper. But there's so many communities between us and downtown Nashville that we feel that and we still want to put our arms around that. And I see our church moving more towards that as we go forward. The new church is called Victory Church. It's called the Victory Church of Nashville. <laughs> the Victory Church of Nashville. Okay. Yes, sir. How, how, do, how do people... Uh, Follow your ministry. Uh, you, you were my first trainee. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> how do they follow you? How do they get information about you? Well, there's a couple uh, couple avenues. Of course, we have a website for our church, thevictorychurch.org. We're also on Instagram, and we're also uh, on Facebook under the Victory Church of Nashville. And then you can follow me on DerekFaison.com. You can follow me on Instagram, Derek Faison. You can follow me on Twitter, at Derek Faison. I make it really easy. <laughs> but all of those avenues are on social media. And we also have a YouTube page. So every sermon, every message that I preach is loaded up onto our YouTube page where you can access all of our sermons, our messages, um, upcoming events, and all of that. And he can preach to you all, so you need to go check it out. 
Right. Uh, I'm, I'm trained by I'm trained by the best. <laughs> I saw you preaching on TBN. Did you see me? Oh did yeah, you? yeah. I was very proud of you. I I thought you you did it really. I, I I used to take him. I used to give him a tough time. Yes, yes. I used to give him a tough time. I I I would do exercises and take him through all kinds of stuff and the sermon preparation and. Preaching on a dime, and the sign would we be driving down the road, and one sign would say "One way, do not enter." And yeah. I say, "Preach on that sign, one way, do not enter." It had to preach. It had yeah. to preach. I, I'll tell you this, which people don't know: um, uh, before I spoke in your pulpit, I had never, ever in my life done public speaking, ever. Mm. Not even school, high school, or anything like that, and. Um, but you believed in God's calling on my life. And, and one of the things you did to help me overcome the fear of standing in front of a crowd was you made me the worship leader. And every Sunday I had to get up and lead the worship, right? Had the, remember you had the overhead projectors? Yes. I had to, so that means Saturday night, I couldn't be running around or playing or whatever. I had to approach it like a sermon. I had to pick the songs, write the songs, be there early, set up everything, and stand up in front of 15, 20 people, <laughs> which at the time was like 3,000 people. Right, right, right. And sing the song of the Lord. But it helped me. And, and one of the things you would say to me was that you don't want to let, I want to make sure that, that, that the pulpit doesn't bully you. Mm -hmm. like you want to be able to stand there confidently and comfortably and speak or sing or whatever it was. And it helped me. It really did help me because I didn't, I couldn't see the connection between the call of God on my life and the pulpit seemed so intimidating and frightening, but just making me, and I didn't want to do it. Let me be honest with you right now. I didn't want to do it. I, mm -hmm. I did not want to do it. And you would call me and say, you're doing worship. And I would be really upset because mm -hmm. I didn't want to do, didn't want to do it. But I knew you didn't, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care. I, did, I didn't care. I, I, I think too many times pastors are trying to be popular and pleasers rather than leaders. You, yeah. it, it got you ready for the mic, but it also taught you responsibility. Yes, sir. You were, you were held accountable for something. I had an expectation for you. You had to be at a certain place at a certain time in a certain condition in a certain way. You had to lead the worship service. That's leadership. You know, you had to have developed leadership skills. You had to plan. You had to prepare. And, and even if you messed it up, and this is the hard part about uh, delegating, you have to give people room to fail. Yes, sir. You know, you have to give people room to fail. And there has to be a way for the prodigal son to get home. Yes, sir. There has to be a way for you to chastise somebody and not kill them. Yeah. Because if God dealt with us like that, we'd all be dead. Everybody. So, so, you know, teaching a way for you to have those experiences. I found that, that pastoring, particularly black men, is 70% fathering. 70% fathering. And 30% preaching. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot more about fathering uh, than, than people. And if you're not prepared, to get down there and be a father because most of us have already been abandoned by a father. Right. And we don't right. need to have a repeat experience. Right. So if so you don't start that if you're not gonna ride through the storm and the trouble and the trauma and the dark days and all that. Because if we give up on us, who have we got? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I don't care what you do. If we give up on us, we have nobody else. So we, we, we have to be able to do that. That's true. Now you're down there in Charleston. You're 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 down in my stomping grounds. I was born in that city. I was raised in South Charleston. Uh, I, I I know that city uh, pretty well. And and your church mission. Let's talk about that and what your vision is. What you've done. What you want to do. Well, I'm the pastor of Abundant Life Ministries in Charleston and in Huntington, West Virginia. And actually, Bishop, it was today one year ago. Uh, to this day where I was consecrated to the office of bishop. Wow. And it's something that um, I never really aspired to because of the standard that you set. It was such a high bar. And my thought was I would rather be 
a competent captain than an incompetent general. Mm -hmm. So part of what I want to do is represent and be a true general in the, in the Lord's church as a bishop. So that's one of the things to be over other pastors now, to be over churches in several different states now. That's something that is really that I've been talking to you about that I really want to grow into and make sure I can do that. But on the uh, local level, it is a, a lot of things Pastor Faison was saying. Actually, this Saturday, we're having a toy giveaway and a food giveaway in Huntington. It's uh, December the 12th at 12, so we call it 12-12-12. December the 12th at uh, 12 noon, we're having a toy food giveaway, but it really is just being active in the community. We've been in our, been pastoring now 22 years, Bishop. Wow. And um, we started with two people, with Renee and myself, and the Lord has uh, really blessed. And it's just to continue to be on and be to other people, honestly, what you've been to me. I want to be that type of person, that you have been a person of integrity, a person of honor. That's my goal, to represent you and the kingdom, of course. I want to say, uh, during a very dark moment in our ministerial career, uh, when the church in Denver was, was in shambles, and I needed help to try to at least hold that together, I called you and sent you out there, and you went out there every week for, I don't know how long, a month? or it's long, like five weeks. Yeah. Five weeks at top Bible class and held that, that church together and, and fed the flock and ministered to them in, through a crisis with determination and anointing and vigor. And, and I'm so proud of that. You know, I'm so proud uh, that, that I could call on you and get that, that you would do that so well. And, and so proud of who you have become as a, as a man in that city and uh, as a man of God and somebody that the governor looks to and that the mayor talks to and, and that, that uh, has that level of influence in the city. That's, that's an uh, amazing thing. So, so hats off to both of you uh, for, for what you have become. I, I just uh, think we spent a, a great time together and, and had uh, many, many years off camera and on camera uh, through, through dark days and good days. Uh, I've been with both of you with the loss of your mothers. I've been there when things were really dark and tough uh, through different storms in your life. Uh, I've never in my life talked to Pastor Frayson about Pastor Crozier. <laughs> or to Pastor Crozier about Pastor Faces sure. uh, ever in my life. Uh, that, that being that anchor for people, and you would, you, I'll say this and I'll let you go, but uh, you'd be surprised. It's not just preachers that call me. Mm. Leaders and politicians and actors and entertainers and hip hop people and, and sometimes somebody random on, on social media, I try not to, to go in my DMs because cause I'll answer. If I'm not careful, I'll answer somebody I don't even know. Somebody in Ethiopia, I need somebody. I, 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 I talked to a boy that, that was, uh, I think he was a diabetic and he was afraid to go into the hospital because of COVID. And he was a young man inboxing me. Wow. And I and I, I just felt led to talk to him. And so we had this conversation on the internet. Ministry isn't about pulpits or microphones. It's giving service. I can't give service to all four million people. I can't answer everybody who but from time to time challenge yourself not to lose the human touch. A lot of people love crowds, but they don't love people. You know, yeah, they, they love the numbers. They love the offering. They don't love the giver. They don't love the individual. Okay. Uh, and, and challenge yourself not to get so busy that you lose the human touch, that you can't stop and sit down and, and talk to somebody. Yes, sir. 
that 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 is real important. And you and you do it for you. It's not just for them. You do it for you. So so that you can keep your heart right yes, toward God. And so that you can say, Lord, I blew a thousand things you told me to do. I disgraced you. I embarrassed you. I humiliated you. I let you down. But I've been faithful over a few things. Thank you. Yes, sir. I got. A, I did a few things that you could count on me for. Mm -hmm. And the Bible said, if you can manage to have a few things, mm -hmm. God will make you rule over many. And it looks like that's what he's done with you, you. both of you. And uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. Much success with your ministries. And listen, friends, if you are anywhere in West Virginia, and you can slide, skate, uh, roll uh, down to Abundant Life and experience uh, Bishop Wayne Crozier's ministry, uh, I believe you'll be blessed. They're streaming online. Uh, you can follow the stream on Sunday nights, on Wednesday nights. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and get that information. If you're in Nashville and you want to be a part of a church that is emerging and evolving to a place of influence, and maybe you've got church hurt, or maybe you've been backslidden, maybe Maybe you're ashamed. Maybe you need somebody to mentor you and develop you and build you up. Uh, going over there to uh, uh, Victory Church uh, of Nashville and allow uh, the ministry of Pastor Derek Faison to speak into your life. Follow them online. Check them out. Check them out. And uh, they get in a good ministry and grow. Uh, they come from good stock. <laughs> they, they come from real good stock. We, I know we're getting to the point that we don't think we need a church or a pastor, but you do. You need somebody uh, that will be in your life what life didn't give you. So we are to stand in the hedge and make up the gap. And wherever there are gaps in your life, our ministry wants to do that through Jesus Christ. I pray ye therefore in Christ's stead be ye reconciled unto God. So it's not really us, it's Christ, but Christ in us is the hope of glory. Yes, sir. He would not call men if he didn't want to use men. I know men fail every day. They're going to always fail every day. That does not negate the fact that he calls them. I baked a cake the other day and it failed. And I still baked another one. I didn't throw the oven out because the cake failed. I just went back in there and started stirring up again. That's good. You understand what I'm saying? And then don't 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 give up on the commission Amen. Be, because of of some some failure or some flaw or something you read or something you saw or something you heard. If you're accusing preachers of being uh flawed and human, you're right. We 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 didn't come from heaven. We came from the same earth and the same streets that you did. Mm. And we are like you. Yes, sir. We are like you. And so we don't, we don't preach because of our perfection. We preach because of his perfection. And, and we preach him, not us. Uh, so I encourage you not to get in this group of people who have become embittered by church. They're, they're embittered by church. They're not embittered by anything else. People still go to the strip clubs. Even though the prostitute wasn't sincere, the stripper was lying, and, 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 and the owner was on the tape, but they still go to the strip club. We still go to the doctor, even though there are doctors sued for malpractice. When something hurts, we still go to the doctor. People still go to the mechanic, even though they didn't get it right three times and you took it back again, that you don't stop driving. Why would you get to God and say, if anybody lets me down, I'm throwing the whole thing away? Wow. Wow. So I encourage you today to uh, find you a, a service that works for you. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of churches out here. One of them will work. If none of them work for you, there's something wrong with you. And get in there and grow and be fed and be nurtured. And don't let anybody run you out. We've enjoyed talking to you tonight. It's yeah. been wonderful. I've enjoyed talking to you guys. <laughs> I enjoyed talking to you, Bishop. It's been a yeah. blessing, sir. Yeah, it's always a blessing. <laughs> uh, much love to you and to your families. Thank you. Thank During you. this holiday season, in the middle of this pandemic, 
with all of these things and new rules and mask and distancing and all of that, uh, it's good to see you well yeah. and healthy. Yeah. So many people are sick and suffering. And the fact that we're able to talk and we're not on ventilators, yeah. it's my, my new definition of doing well. Yeah. Every day I wake up and my lips aren't tied to a ventilator. Yes, sir. I say it's a good day. It's a good day. So I've redefined what a good day looks like to me. Oh, so I'm happy to see that you're having a good day. And I hope those of you that are watching are having one too. And if you're not, I'm praying that you will have one soon. Thank you for listening today. God bless you. I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, the senior pastor of the Potter's House here in Dallas, Texas. TDJakes.org unlocks the whole universe of ministries, philanthropic works, teaching, preaching, books, materials, my for-profit companies. I, I am a businessman. I am an entrepreneur. I've had my own business longer than I had the Potter's House. But my calling is to preach the gospel. So I speak on a lot of platforms, but none of them are as important as speaking to you. May the grace of God be with you until we meet again.